Muhammad so-and-so running for something out here. Miss so-and-so, right? There's more Arabs, and not Arabs, but there's more Negroes from over there running a thing. Why? They got hope in it here. We're here. We got hope. You guys are lazy, shiftless and lazy. That's what the ones that's running for government. But you know what their children are? They're just like us. Because the children born and raised here are treated like niggas. And they so absorbed in that if you can work for a few hours a day, you're going to get paid all of this money. Right? And they're not thinking about nothing else. They're not thinking about oppression. You could beat them upside the head. They said, oh, that's a nice boss. He just beat me upside the head, but he let me make $100 today. So he's happy, right? He wouldn't make $100 in a month back there, right? All those things are what Malcolm called chickens coming home to roost. In our generation, chickens coming home to roost. Their children and even the Muslim children, the people that immigrated over here that cut us off every in and out of every masjid and don't want to talk to us, don't want to hear about us and don't want to see us, their children or grandchildren in the universities right now. You ought to hear them. You know what they are? They are Americans with a tinge of color, and that's enough. We don't have to take that. Their mama and them took it. Their daddy and them took it. They, hey, they were, we're happy to take it. Why? Because the dictators back home wouldn't give you nothing. Now the dictators over here, you at least get a, a nice little house, something to eat, stuff like that, right? Anyway, That's the difference between us. You have to remember even the hadith that we're dealing with today. This is our position. If we were others, it would look like a very lonely position. You know, even my son said, yeah, 30, 40 years. He said, yeah, Dad, I guess this, this is a pretty lonely job. Because he would see me there at the masjid. He would see what would be happening. And I said, lonely? This is a happy, the happiest I ever been. He thought Jahiliya, because they see all the pictures, all the big suits and big cars. To them, that was happiness. I try to tell them, y'all don't know what's going on. This is happiness. That was insanity. And in fact, I think I'm one of the only ones that will admit it. See, because other people, well, that's because becoming Muslim. But if that's the only thing you have, imagine the insanity. If you're a big movie star, you're a beautiful physical body. Everybody love you. They chasing you around the street to get your autograph, Right. You live, you got three swimming pools, you got all kind of girlfriends, boyfriends, everybody uh, just can't do without you. All right? And you crazy as a Betsy book. Because what makes you, it makes you crazier because you have everything that they told you was nice and it don't make you happy. That makes it worse. On the other hand, I got hold to it. I just admitted it. I said, I ain't happy. Shoot, I ain't happy. So ain't making me happy. So I said, bump it. I'll help somebody else with it. Right? I mean, that's, that's what we did. And that, that's why the people we know, they can't understand it. They're old as I am or older, some of them. And they still trying to get happiness out of that old dumb stuff. 
Anyway, let me speed up here. Okay. A prudent instruction, a straight path, and a manifest truth which protects man's thoughts from taking wrong inclinations and his tongue from committing distortions. That is, people introduce change in previous divine divine books through the tongue by mispronouncing words in them. But the Quran has been protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself until the day of judgment against all distortions. So the Quran is clear. There's no distortions, right? It's a hidayah. The scholars will never get satiated with its knowledge. That is the work of pondering upon the Quran and instigating, investigating truth and knowledge. In it shall be forever. A time shall never come for a scholar to feel that they have discovered the Quran fully and that there remains nothing else to pursue further. I don't care how book, how good a book is you've read. After you read it over and over and over again, you already know what's going to happen, right? The Quran is not like that. The Quran, the more you read it, the deeper it gets. Every Ramadan and biannual reading or what have you, for us is an experience. How did I miss that? After you've read a secular book, you know every scene. When you get to a scene, you know what it is, right? The life that we're living is not like that. You get to a certain point, and it is more exciting. This is more exciting and more comprehensive <clears throat> than basically anything you could do. Why? Because the Quran has given you the guidance and Remember, it's like you was alive. When it talks about history, it's like you were alive amongst the people and with them. And as the writings say, you saw what helped them and you saw what hurt them. You saw what guided them and you saw what misguided them. Okay, that is the exact reason that we give the information that we get. Well, why don't we sugarcoat it or change it to something else? Well, if we would have more friends. Who needs them kind of friends? Those are not friends. Those are dummies. Right? We tried to help some of the people around here, and they let us know clearly, we don't want you to come around and tell us and help us to protect us, we're going to get women, put them out there, because the Quran says what it says. That's what they did, that's what they said, and that's what they meant, and that's what they practiced. Yet and still, their grandchildren, who are in university, have become Americanized. And they see it's American to stand up for your rights. And the Zionist of the biggest problems for us here in America, they're saying it. Not the parents. Definitely not the grandparents. They're just happy as they could be to get here. But the children are not happy to be here. You know, the most rebellious places in the United States was in the North during the racial tension. Why not the South? It was worse down there. Well, then, what about us? We came up here, and, man, it was, it was technically, it was sweet. But we were saying it could be better than this, man. I don't like that. 
All the violence was up here. None of it was down in Dixie. And they were still lynching them down there. Down there, they were still getting lynched. Of course, they were shooting us up here, but not lynching. And we was, you know, passing it around a little bit ourselves after a while. Okay. Scholars will never get saturated with this knowledge. The work of pondering upon the Quran and investigating the truth and knowledge in it shall continue forever. A time shall never come for scholars to feel that they have discovered the Quran fully and that there remains nothing else to pursue further. To the contrary, the more and the more they advance in their understanding of the Quran, the more earnestness to learn further will they develop. They will feel that they have learned what they have learned is absolutely nothing in comparison to what is still beyond their knowledge. The Quran, the Quran will never grow old due to excessive reading. Like other books, after you read them once or five times, some people can read a book five times. Most people can't do this over and over again. The more you do that with the Quran, the more interesting it gets. The Quran, the Quran will never grow old due to excessive reading. As against other books, the Quran will appear more interesting when recited more and pondered upon more. And the wonders of the Quran, i.e. its deep and subtle knowledge and wisdom, will never ex be exhausted. The glory of the Quran is such that when the jinns heard it, they said, we have really heard a wonderful recital. It gives guidance to the right, and we have believed therein. He who spoke in accordance with the Quran and said the truth. He who acted upon it deserved reward. He who judged according to it observed justice. And he who invited toward it was shown the straight path. So the Quran, this is when Ali is asking the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about his statement about a great fitna is going to appear. Well, how do I get do that fitna, the Quran. And this is what it does. So basically, this is where everything that we're doing is coming from. It's coming from the Quran. It's coming from Hadith. And it's coming for history. This is, this is all. This is not magic. And then Allah have blessed us enough to incorporate those things that we get from these sources and apply it to the time in which we live. That's why our batting average is 985 instead of 300 or 350. That's it. That's it. And everything from, what do we call it, uh, systems analysis, it's from one of our lectures back in 13. System analysis, analysis, well, you analyze the system that you're living under, right? You analyze the whole system, just a regular analysis. Boop, and you come up with the answers. There it is. That's all you have to do. Systems analysis. Like if something break down, you know, and, and you, they, they do it in these computers and all this mumble jumble stuff, right? You just investigate, uh, analyze according to a, an analysis, and boop, it comes right up. The other thing is, 
this one we call Project Imam Hussein in America. I mention this because Arbain has just finished and one of our great friends just got out of prison, him and his wife, the other day or a month ago, something like that. It was a while back. But at the same time, does anybody know how many people got killed today or yesterday in Nigeria? Nobody's been paying attention to that. The last few days, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's what they're doing. They, look, I'm telling you that they killed Alamazak Zaki's three sons.